Classical swine fever, or European swine fever, also known as hog cholera, is caused by a pestivirus from the family Flaviviridae and is closely related to bovine viral diarrhea virus. The disease has the potential to spread rapidly and mortalities can reach almost 100% in naive populations. It has a major impact on the international trade of pigs and pork products, which can lead to substantial financial losses for the pig industry. Classical swine fever can break out without warning, especially in countries that have been free of the disease for many years. An epidemic in the Netherlands in 1997 resulted in the destruction of a total of 8 million pigs and an estimated loss of 2 billion US dollars. This video will show the impact of classical swine fever on the pig industry. It will also highlight the extreme measures needed to eradicate this disease after incursion into a country free of the disease. South Africa has not only a highly sophisticated pig industry which produces a hundred thousand tons of pork annually for the local market, but also an informal trade in pigs based on subsistence farming in rural areas. The country was free of classical swine fever for nearly a hundred years, but in 2005 the situation changed drastically. Classical swine fever virus was apparently introduced from Southeast Asia. It is suspected that the virus entered the country through the feeding of swill containing pork products originating from ships docked at Cape Town Harbour. It then spread rapidly amongst various pig units and rural communities in the eastern and western Cape provinces. The disease was particularly prevalent in enterprises where pigs from breeding units were transported over long distances to fattening units. There were also outbreaks amongst free-ranging rural pigs along the bus routes in the Eastern Cape. This suggested that workers or the transport of pig products along these routes could have played an important role in spreading the disease. There is constant movement of buses between here and Western Cape on a weekly basis, there's a bus that moves from Cape Town to Tendane every Monday and it goes back every Thursday and on its way to here, it stops at Worcester. It's likely that it may have picked up uh, passengers destined for here who may have carried as part of their provision meat which might have, which might have been infected with the virus. The state veterinary services immediately embarked on a stamping out campaign to try and eradicate the disease as soon as possible. This entailed the humane slaughter of all infected and in contact pigs in commercial units and in rural areas. The institution of strict quarantine measures as well as the disinfection of contaminated premises. It soon became evident that there were other foci in the Eastern Cape that were not linked to the spread along the bus routes. The original outbreak was at Koloha, and because of our zero surveillance, these other red dots were, were, were established. And whilst we were busy here doing zero surveillance, we were informed of that pocket of infection in Queenstown and we had already conducted zero surveillance between this hotspot and Queenstown and there is no infection between Queenstown and the current pocket of infection that we're dealing with. The outbreak in the Queenstown area originated from commercial enterprises. By this time, the pig industry in the Eastern Cape was already suffering from the devastating consequences of the strict quarantine measures that prohibited all movement of pigs and pig products out of the province. Early detection of the virus is critical in order to contain the disease. 
This is usually done by the use of the immunofluorescence test or polymerase chain reaction method on various organs, the tonsils being the most important. The extent of spread should also be established by the use of serological tests. We immediately embarked on a serosurveillance that was started within the next week. We've been taking uh, blood samples for serology, blood samples for virus uh, detection, that is heparinized blood samples, and continuing to perform post-mortems on any cases uh, that we find uh, dead. And since then we have confirmed a number of fossa in and around cholera area which were positive for CSF. We have also confirmed other fossa far out of this area which have been seropositive for the disease. The most typical feature of classical swine fever is that it is so atypical. Signs of acute disease appear after an incubation period of two to six days. The early stage is characterized by fever, dullness and a reluctance to move and eat. The signs progress over the next few days with body temperatures being between 41 and 42 degrees Celsius. Pigs develop conjunctivitis early on, leading to an ocular discharge. Evidence of digestive tract involvement includes constipation, which is sometimes followed by diarrhea. During the terminal stages of the disease, most pigs have a typical weaving or staggering gait, often followed by posterior paresis. Occasionally, convulsions are seen. A purplish discoloration of the skin which extends over the abdomen, snout, ears and inner sides of the limbs may also occur terminally. Vomiting and constipation with blood-stained mucus on the feces may occur. Pregnant sows often abort. When pigs survive beyond 30 days, the infection is considered chronic and leads to severe growth retardation and the development of runted pigs. Such pigs may be ill for months but eventually die. The tissues and organs of animals that have died from acute or subacute classical swine fever show multiple hemorrhages of various sizes which result from damage to capillary endothelial cells and from a defect in blood coagulation. Hemorrhages are most frequently present in lymph nodes and kidneys. Virtually all lymph nodes are affected. Infarctions, which are the result of occlusion of small arteries by thrombi, are characteristic of the pathology. The presence of splenic infarcts are a common finding in acute classical swine fever. The stomach fundus is often congested and hemorrhagic and may contain erosions. Pregnant sows infected by strains of moderate or low virulence may develop the carrier sow syndrome. Depending on the stage of gestation and the virulence of the virus strain, congenital infection can result in abortion, fetal mummification, stillbirth, the birth of weak and trembling pigs, neonatal death, or the birth of healthy looking but persistently infected piglets, which maintain the disease in a population and can easily introduce it into naive pig populations. This happened in a fattening unit close to Alwal North in the Eastern Cape, where there were more than 3,000 pigs. All the pigs were slaughtered after four of them had tested positive. I believe the specific Alwal North one, the positive pigs were identified in the Wiener pigs. The Wiener pigs arrived on the 9th of August from Queenstown and had been here 21 days before we identified the positiveness of those pigs. So the possibilities are, well, it's most probable those pigs came up from the breeding unit in Queenstown. The disease is primarily transmitted by contact with the oral and nasal secretions of infected pigs. But farmers, castrators, inseminators and veterinarians can also transmit the virus by use of contaminated instruments. Boars may shed the virus in their semen, which can infect sows. 
The virus can survive for weeks in liquid manure, but otherwise it only survives outside the host for a few days. Post this incident we would have to step up our biosecurity. We would have to look at making this possibly a closed unit where we would have to separate our transportation, our meal deliveries and other delivery vehicles from any pigs or meal being delivered and we would have to shower people in and out and disinfect people in and out as a precautionary measure from now on. Since the virus is not always inactivated by the processing of pork and its products, such as ham, bacon and sausages, the feeding of improperly heat-treated swill can initiate an outbreak of hog cholera. Once the culling has stopped, we would go through a disinfection program of the internal and external sites of the piggery and the dumping sites. We'd go under disinfection, and I believe that's what, once that is dried and settled, we we do a second disinfection program, and I believe you can, 56 days after that, you can restock your unit and you can start farming pigs again. The domestic pig and wild boar are the only animals that become naturally infected. It is not known whether the wild suids of Africa are susceptible to the virus. Therefore, all free-ranging domestic pigs within the affected areas were slaughtered. It became a difficult task to track down all these pigs in the remote and informal settlements. During the entire campaign, the NSPCA played an active role to ensure that all animals were treated and slaughtered in a humane way. Um, it, is, it is a daunting task um, of capturing these pigs, handling them um, and then having to, to destroy them as well. Um, it's extremely stressful on both parties, the pigs as well as the humans. But I do believe that we've worked at a, as a good team um, from both sides and I think it's, it's turning out to be success. To get the best possible cooperation from the local people, each and every owner was compensated for their pigs at commercial prices. Veterinary checkpoints were set up at strategic points to prevent the movement of pigs and their products and to disinfect vehicles. Yeah, we, we, we want to make sure that we contain the disease. We take the Tendana area as the, the, the dirty area. So we, we, we don't want any movement of the, the pig and their products from Tendana into the lean areas. So what we are looking for at this point, we are looking for the live pig and for the meat, that is pork. It became a joint operation between the South African National Police Service, the Traffic Department, State Veterinary Services, and the South African National Defence Force. There is compensation of pigs inside. There is a possibility for them to take the live pigs into the infected area with the purpose of getting the, the, the money. So we also try to, to, to control those things. We, we are trying to kill the virus. Yeah, we, we, we want to make sure that we contain the disease. As classical swine fever can have a devastating effect on the national and international trade in pigs and their products, it is critical that all countries have measures in place to prevent the introduction and spread of this disease. Oh, yeah.